welcome to In the Kitchen, Conversations on IoT with Breadware. I'm your host, Carrie Siggin, CEO of Breadware. And today I am so excited to have Dixon Chu with me. He is the CEO of Copper, and he's going to tell us all about that. So Dixon, welcome. Hey, thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me. Um, yep. As Gary said, I'm the CEO of Copper. Um, Copper is an IoT platform. And what we do is we liberate legacy POS systems. We liberate their data and liberate the transactions um, with a, um, a device that we've invented. Um, think of it as a, um, a single chip computer that talks Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, very compact. In fact, looks just like th this is exactly it. And we basically, it's all disguised as a printer cord. So we plug it into the printer port of a, a traditional POS terminal, an NCR, a micros, and we plug it into the receipt printer. And thereafter, um, we capture all the data that comes out of the printer port and, and we, we parse it for a, a bunch of different use cases. Right now, quite topically because of COVID and so forth, um, we are able to create a contactless payment experience. So what happens is the servers, you ask the server for your check, they print the check and um, it looks like a normal check, it all happens in real time, but now we've inserted a QR code at the bottom. So she brings you your ticket and says, hey, you don't have to give me a card, just scan the QR with your phone, no app required, just open the camera, and then you go through a very simple e-commerce like two page checkout and you pay with Apple Pay or Google Pay if you have an Android phone or you can key your card number in and you're done. And then we email you a receipt when, um, afterwards. Um, alternatively, we also have our device will also talk to some handheld devices. Like uh, I'm sure some of your audience, you know, you've been to any, anywhere but the, the US, you pay at the table when you check out at the restaurant. So they bring a terminal over and they swipe your card or dip your card. We actually turbocharge that experience in that we support a, a handful of uh, handheld devices, except what's different is two very important things. One, you get to see your receipt on the, on the device. So you see all the items, you review it, and then um, we let you just pay. Or um, as it is quite popular in, in certain demographics, you want to split the check. Well, we do something that no one else does. We let you split the check at the item level. So patron number one says, hey, I didn't have the appetizer. I'm not paying for that. And so I'm just going to pay for this one and this one. You check it off and then you, you pay. You tap your card, you dip your card, you swipe, you're done. And then you go around. So those are one, that's the most popular use case for our, our device. Um, there's some other things that we do. But at the end of the day, what we do is we've liberated the data and we've parsed it and we, we, we play it back in terms of different um, uses. I love this. I have uh, been waiting for the U.S. to catch up with everybody else with not walking, not letting the waiter walk away with your credit cards. So I think this technology sounds um, like it's going to hopefully spread throughout the U.S. and, and change our practices here, too. Do you see that? Yeah, happening? it always seems a little strange, doesn't it? If you've been to other yeah. places where they come up and, you know, you don't, someone doesn't run away with your card. Who knows who's touching it and where it's been and all that. So hopefully we can do our part to accelerate that adoption in the, in the U.S. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about you. So why are you passionate about the advancement of technology like this, particularly as it relates to IoT? Yeah, yeah. So um, I will confess, I'm, I'm not a technologist. I probably know enough to be terribly dangerous and be annoying to my tech and product teams. Um, but I've been in and around technology for a long time and what are creative ways to, to use it to change the way people behave, particularly around banking and payments, which is most of my career. And so if I, as I think about where we are today with IoT, um, and think of IoT as nothing more than um, a small device that's gonna connect you to the internet, right? Now, of course, we are already living in an incredibly connected world. Right? Everyone's got a phone. I read a stat recently that says, there actually are more cell phones out in the world than there are toothbrushes. Isn't that kind of scary? 
Um, and so, so we're all connected, but that's, that's your personal device. Well, shouldn't many other things also be able to be controlled, be monitored and so forth? I mean, as a sort of personal story, my wife and I just bought a condo in, in Florida to be, to be able to see her parents more regularly and conveniently. We're only going to use it two or three times a year, right? Um, well, I put a, a electronic lock on and I can control it wherever I am in the world. I can give it a special code for someone to access once only, um, things like that. I mean, that's, uh, that's a, a very sort of personalized view of IoT. Um, in our case, our little device now has internet enabled, um, a traditional kind of desktop computer, which is what a, what, what, um, these POS systems are. And then a printer, a $200 printer that does a singular thing. But now we've, we've, we've enabled it to be seen and the data to be captured, um, on the internet and then all kinds of cool things happen. So I think that it sort of unlocks a lot of different potential, but at the same time, uh, it helps people preserve the investments they've made. You know, the, the other analogy as a great IoT example, and, and, you know, I'm sure the IoT purists would say, well, that's not really true, is like Roku. What a great technology. Let's say you've got a great home entertainment system all set up, but your TV is a few years old. Now you want to have YouTube TV or apps on the TV. Do you rip and replace and to make it a smart TV, which is what the manufacturers want you to do? Or you spend 40 bucks at, and, and get a Roku subscription, and now you've got apps on your TV and the rest of your setup is preserved and it's what you're used to and you like. So all these possibilities are just kind of, are just there. And, and it makes me excited in terms of um, what can happen with payments, what can happen with personalization of delivery of services. Um, I, I, I think it's, for me, a whole new, whole new frontier and applying the stuff I already know to a context that, um, that I think it's ever evolving, but it, in really great ways that deliver value to both merchants and to consumers. Yeah, I agree. It is, uh, it is adding a lot of convenience and uh, making life a lot easier in so many ways. Of course, you know, we're looking at our phones a lot more often, but uh, I am, I'm, I love the IoT enabled devices in my life. They've definitely improved the quality of my life. Some seem frivolous, but others are really quite helpful. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's like the whole thing when people are talking about, you know, it's mobile, this mobile, that when you really think about your, your mobile device, rarely is it really a phone anymore, but it does two things. It's either there to help you save time because it's really convenient, you can do things faster, or it just help you to, you know, more efficiently waste time. <laughs> I'm gonna play a game, I'm gonna do, watch YouTube, I'm gonna do other things. But, um, but in either case, it, it provides a huge convenience. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, POS systems. So do you think IoT is going to uh, disrupt current point of sale systems? What do you think the future looks like? Well, we're certainly trying our, to do our part. Um, let's take a half a step back on that just to, to, to address the question kind of um, in a somewhat roundabout way, but I think history is important. If you think about all these POS systems, and right now we're serving restaurants, but we're not restricted to restaurants. In the U.S., just in restaurants, right now at the last count, there's something like 130 different POS brands, right? There's some concentration, but... Why are there so many? I mean, are they really that specialized? So, so, um, so one, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of confusion and proliferation. The second thing is fundamentally, they're all built the same way. Uh, believe it or not, when you go into your restaurant, they've got a, um, you know, an expensive terminal and so forth. I won't use any brands, any names, but that software is running like on an old Windows computer. Right. It's a old fashioned desktop with a fancy touch screen, but it's 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 a little behind the times. It's not catching up to available technologies. Now, about 10 or 12 years ago, you had all these companies that said, no, no, we're going to disrupt the whole POS industry. It's all going to the cloud. 
So a new brand set of folks show up with their tablet-based POSs, and it's on the cloud. Now, that's kind of an overused term, but all it means is, okay, well, it's connected, and you can do software upgrades and so forth remotely. Um, you know, there's a centralization in the cloud versus sitting on this trapped in your desktop. Okay, that's great. Ten years later, you count up all the cloud POS, these fancy new systems on tablets and so forth, they maybe have 20% market share in, over, in the 10 years time. So I think the disruption question is a difficult one because um, just like, you know, I've spent 30 years of my career trying to digitize cash and get rid of checks. Well, guess what? Last year, there were still like two and a half trillion dollars of checks issued and there's still cash. And so I think it's going to take time, but I think what, Things like what we're doing and IoT technology is going to do is helps you preserve what you have in a super important way. Um, you don't have to retrain your, your workers. They're accustomed to a certain workflow and they like the interface of what they have. But now let's, let's give it a smart upgrade like the Roku stick. In our case, like our copper cord, we now liberate it and we can deliver new functionality without you having to rip and replace. I think that by itself is going to um, create a bit of a disruption because it's going to cause those business models to, to, to have to think about what they deliver, how they make money. Um, it's a pretty classic um, razors and razor blade kind of business, right? Hey, we're going to sell you this expensive box and then we're going to charge you a monthly fee to keep it going. Um, and and there has to be a way to... to to disrupt that. I mean, if, if the shave club can disrupt the whole razors business, I think that, um, you know, with something like liberating that, that the data and then doing new things with it in a very uh, efficient way, that that's going to create a kind of disruption. Yeah, it seems to me like there's lots of micro disruptions happening and that's what's going to add up to the big thing. And maybe that's really how disruption works, right? It's not some huge uh, change in technology that just happened overnight. It's little micro disruptions, micro disruptions. And then all of a sudden you look back two or three late years later and you're doing something completely differently than you did before. Oh, I, 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 I totally agree with that. I mean, look at the way we live today, right? I mean, more people will leave their house without their keys or their wallet, but they never leave without their cell phone. And when you think about cellular technology and, and, you know, cell phones, the form factor shrunk, and it's really only been about 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, can you imagine anyone living without that? And you think about the way people have changed, the way they live, the way they entertain themselves, the way they work, like massive disruption in terms of behaviors and then new businesses that evolve from it but it happened a little at a time. It sort of sneaks up on you. And I, I love that term. It's micro disruptions that add up. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, um, the world looks differently and you behave differently. Yeah, yeah. So how does that relate to um, the future of contactless payments? We, we talked a little bit about it, but you know, what do you think it looks like five years from now, 10 years from now? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, sort of pick your analysts. Everyone has a different set of numbers, but the numbers I'm going to use, and I won't name the analysts, but I've, I've seen it a couple of times, is um, right now worldwide, there's believed to be about $170 billion worth of contactless payments happening. Now, um, to be fair, I think a lot of that's actually happening in China um, with um, the likes of, of WeChat Pay and Alipay. I mean, a billion people can't be wrong. Right. I mean, there's no one that has cash anymore in China and everyone just scans a QR code and pays that way. And it's starting to go around the world. One estimate says that in about five years, that number is going to go from 170 billion to potentially 1.3, 1.4 trillion. So that's a massive growth. Right. But I think what it portends is um, there's an acceleration of consumer adoption. They're saying, hey, this is just easier, just like we said earlier. Why am I giving you my card and you go away with it and all that? I want to control it myself. I want the data. You know, I want to um, have as much convenience, but also control. 
And so, you know, a contact list expresses itself in all sorts of ways. There's scanning the QR, the controller on your phone. There's tapping your phone. I mean, it's funny. Um, it's now, what, 10 years, a little more than 10 years. I was part of the effort that, um, that teamed with Google and MasterCard to create the very first generation of Google Wallet, right? We were going to just change everybody, right? Change POS. Everyone's going to be NFC and contactless tapped and all that. Didn't quite happen, but it's happening. And it just sort of takes a bit of time. But I think, you know, the if there's a silver lining in the last year or so of COVID, um, I think consumer behavior is actually now really shifting, particularly in the U.S. to adopt this as, look, you're right. I don't want to give you my card. You know, what kind of germs are on that or whatever security concerns. And I don't want to touch that menu. And but, you know, why can't I have that experience and control it? And so I think that some of these kind of little trends are going to add up to lots of people are saying, well, this is why wouldn't I pay this way? Right. Um, and I think you take that contactless bit even further and there's no contact at all. It's like, if I walk in, I've been there before, it can sense the, uh, the, the, um, the sensors on my phone, it recognizes me, I sit down. Now, now, there's a creep factor we have to control for, right, from a business model. But it's a little bit like, um, and this, this sounds awful, but it's a, it's a little bit like a country club experience. They know who you are, you're a regular, you sit down, and then when you're done, you don't pay. You sort of sign the sign the ticket and then you go. Why can't you extend that in mass to everybody? Why shouldn't everyone have the same kind of conveniences as well as cost savings for the patron for, for the merchants who are delivering it? It's just a lot cheaper and faster and easier. It's more convenient for you. I mean, how frustrating is, is it when you're sitting in the restaurant, you're done, you ask for your check, you want to go. Well, usually that means they have to run over to the POS, print the ticket, bring it over. You look at it, you give them your card. They're not staying in there waiting. And so you'll wait another 10 minutes before they come back and pick up your credit card. That will run back to the POS, scan that, run the transaction and bring it back to you. Right. Let's cut all that out. It's like yeah. when you're ready to go, you're ready to go. I can pay right now and done. Yeah. And we're, yeah. we're, you know, we're delivering that every day with copper and, I think hopefully it becomes more and more prevalent. Yeah, I uh, it so resonates with me. I I've changed my behaviors based on where I can use my phone to pay with uh, with Apple Pay, and I go to specific grocery stores and restaurants. My favorite liquor store to go get a, a good bottle of wine. I pick those one those ones that I can just use my phone to pay with. And I hadn't really thought about it until recently, how much has changed my behavior by being able to make choice, of, making a choice based on how I pay rather than what the store is actually delivering. It's absolutely right. happening. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think, um, once again, it's one of these micro disruptions that will add up and, and, you know, with that merchants will, won't have a choice. Yeah. They'll say, I have to offer this because I have to be competitive. The well, card yeah, brands, think, yeah. Visa, MasterCard, and all that, they'll have yeah. to change their rules because the pricing is still not not favorable compared to like an old fashioned, you know, show your card and sign your name. Yeah, or I'll give you a discount to pay cash. <laughs> I live in a small <laughs> or, town, or, or, or offer a discount, <laughs> or offer a discount to pay cash. Yes, but you know, actually, honestly, though, cash is expensive to handle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think people realize that. They discount how expensive it is to handle. Yeah. And it's riskier. Uh, hands down, it's riskier. Yeah. So going back to the customer experience, uh, how in, do you think that's going to be the biggest driver of, uh, of the change? Why Visa MasterCard is going to have to change because customers are going to require that type of experience? Um. Yes and no. Um, so I think about customer in two cents. There's the consumer and then there's the merchant. Mm -hmm. For me, the merchant's my customer first in the first order, but 
ultimately, they, yeah, yeah, I need to help the, the merchant deliver a great experience to, to their patron, right, to the consumer. Um, and and as everything we just said, it's just for the consumer, it's much more convenient. Hey, it's safer, it's convenient, it's faster. For the merchant, so let's use rest, continue to use restaurants. Remember that example of like running back and forth? If I reduce that round trip time of the server back to the POS, let's say that I cut 10 to 20 minutes off of every table yeah. to close the table. If you're the restaurant owner, you add that up and you're, you know, you're on a busy night, I could add up to like an extra table turn. That's like real money. You can do that math, right? Um, so those conveniences, it's more than convenience because now you can, you can, you can uh, ascribe revenue growth and cost savings to it. Um, the Visa MasterCard kind of angle on it is they are actually are trying hard to promote more and more digital cash, right? They know that the world's moving in that direction. First of all, for them, their enemy is cash, cash. And so they're saying, Hey, digital payments is the way to go because that's what they run is just a big network. Um, and so what needs to happen is, um, their underlying issuing banks have to come on board and, and say, hey, hey, overall, this totally makes sense. The more it's digital, um, the better, faster, cheaper it's going to be, more efficient system, there'll be more usage. And I think that's happening. It's slower than anyone wants, but it's, it's definitely. Yeah, yeah, that, those are great perspectives. I certainly didn't think about it from a restaurant's perspective of, of you know, reducing that runtime and having an extra table turn. That's that's significant, uh, and so I can see why the merchants would be pushing it um, just as much as the consumer from the convenience perspective. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. All right. So last question: uh, What's the best piece of advice that you would have for leaders and entrepreneurs who are trying to create IoT-enabled solutions and disruptions? <laughs> Great question. Um, my, my own experience and perspective would be, while the technology is difficult or can be difficult, and there's a lot of complexity involved, um, what you deliver has to, the user experience has to be completely simple. So, you know, Think about the tech as not being in the way or front and center. It should be invisible, practically. I mean, that's the whole point of it. And you're delivering an experience, and the experience needs to be fit for market, right? Fit for purpose. And I think simplicity is always super important. So that's that's one thing for sure. The other thing that, um, and I'll use our own experience, um, is unless you're in the widget business and you want to drive the, the bill of materials down to the cheapest possible thing. Well, if you're if it, in the beginning, don't focus on that. Like go and source quality parts because you're going to minimize um, the um, failures and other things that, um, that will happen, but at least start with quality parts. So spend a little bit more. Um, and then finally, um, don't do it yourself. I mean, you guys have been great. You've been very helpful to us. Um, you know, go find a good design firm with that's t aligned with a, a manufacturing partner that you can work with. Um, you know, it's never going to be perfect. You learn together, but you know, you're way better off starting that way. Go get good materials. Go work with a good firm to help you design the thing appropriately. Um, it always helps to have a design firm that's also very familiar with a manufacturer and they need to work close together. Um, and finally, um, back to the parts piece, you know, two things are super important to buy IoT. Um, they are like little computers, right? Little devices. Um, pay attention to power consumption because that actually matters. And lastly, you know, the whole point of it is connected to the internet. Um, pay attention to bandwidth. How are you, what kind of data are you capturing? How are you optimizing for that? So those are from our own experiences. I, you know, I'm sure um, other folks will, will think about it differently, but um, um, that's what little bit of advice I could share. 
Oh, it's great advice. Music to my ears. <laughs> All right, Dixon, how can people find you and how can they find Copper? Um, we are use Copper. Uh, we couldn't get Copper.com because Copper is an incredibly common <laughs> URL and brand. Mm -hmm. So usecopper.com is our website, usecopper.com. And I'm Dixon at usecopper.com, D-I-C-K-S-O-N at usecopper.com. Very Happy good. to take right. comments, love to hear from people, and if we can help you with something you're doing, that'd be great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your insight and knowledge with us today. Uh, it was a great interview, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking with you today. Thanks, Gary. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.